So hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Kocek. I'm the founder and CEO of Chemical Q Device. So this is for how to select the correct QML loss function in optimizers. This is discussion 104 for Thursday, October 12th. So as you can see here, I, I'm going to cover a bunch of these. I'm going to lay uh, kind of, you know, where we are with QML and uh, how it's similar to, to classical, basically, with these frameworks. So there's a there's a number of good resources online as far as if you're just learning this, if you didn't go to school for computer science or machine learning and these types of things. And they related it uh, basically to cold tea and hot tea. So these both have local minimums as far as, you know, the cold tea, you know, closer to zero, you know, C and then the hot tea closer to 60 C. Now, what's interesting about this is you actually, you per, you want the deeper well, uh, but you don't want steepness. So steepness is associated with, you know, barren plateaus or, you know, these types of gradients that aren't as uh, favored in quantum. So the left one uh, would be the, what we're looking for as far as the loss with this is trying to get to that low point. And the right one here is more favorable. You don't want to, uh, like you don't want it like just barren. So it's just like a gradual slope. You just want it like how it would, would roll well with the marble going down a well or, or like to get to the bottom with this. Um, so if you don't know about this, exhaustive exploration, as far as I know, it's not practical for many of the mach machine learning workflows and especially QML workflows then. So it, it uses few assumptions. It's it's more robust, but it's really, really expensive to compute. So this is basically finding the exact answers. Now, some of you may have heard of genetic algorithms, and then we've talked about, um, you know, simulated annealing or simulated uh, quantum annealing in these cases. And this is like doing a, a even greater job than gradient descent or atom optimizer, these types of things. Uh, and it's not it's not as costly as exhaustive exploration, so it makes it somewhat more practical. Now, when we're talking about larger QML and and you know ML workloads. Uh, we're talk typically talking about gradient descent. Now, gradient descent was the first one, so you you basically have a landscape and you're going down and in, down into the well uh, and trying to find these minimums with loss and and these types of things. So you're making more assumptions. It's more sensitive, uh, but it's a lot easier to compute. And I'll show you some examples coming up that if you don't set the learning rate uh, correctly, you know, even if this efficient method is, is good, um, it could still take forever. So the basically the author of this, and he's based in, I think, uh, uh, Boston. So he said, receiving, and this is paraphrased, receiving a good machine learning answer that's as good as we can get, but not perfect, is common for workflows due to time and cost. Right. So you might, as you're starting to, you know, figure things out, start to go left in this, uh, it's, you know, spending more compute times if you want the absolute best performance, at, at, typically at the sake of time. So with this, and at the, at the top here, I put a qubit in the landscape. So especially for deep learning landscapes, they're not just one local minimums. It's more like a like one of these, uh, you know, presenters said that it's like a corrugated foam mattress. You know, it's got a bunch of these. And some are easier to overcome than others as far as getting to the, the bottom of these wells. But it's they can be tricky as far as getting to your true lowest loss. And uh, when you're running these, so in CoLab or Kiskit or whatever, you can monitor the, the changes in loss. So if you're heading down consistently, it's good. And, you know, if it keeps going down quickly, that you might have had a, a good selection of loss function and optimizer, these combos. So, you know, even though exhaustive search is straightforward, uh, you know, it's this computationally rich, uh, you know, typically not for many batching uh, machine learning workflows, you know, uh, several batches per, uh, several small batches per e epoch, just not as, you know, as, as favored as like gradient descent. And some of these I covered, so genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, gradient descent, um, you know, are typically what we're, we're going to be focusing on here with this, uh, you know, to find your correct loss function and uh, optimizer. So in QML hybrid loss functions, it's very similar to classical. It's just whatever happened with this quantum circuit, so we're talking quantum inspired machine learning, is that, you know, it has some extra cost to it because of the, the qubit. Now, ideally, you know, we want performance to match that that cost that we're taking with the qubit, and we're not there yet, right? So a lot of times we're just seeing the cost. 
<laughs> so as within any emerging technology with this is that we want to you know see the benefits of, of uh you know this a lot richer qubit than a bit and so there can be many local minima but we want to we want the deepest so as that you know cold tea and, and hot tea example we want the deeper well you know so, so that's the lower loss of them and steeper slope, steeper slopes, uh, you know, require larger or can do larger steps. And then, as you get as you get down towards the bottom of these wells, represented in blue up here, then you can decrease it. So if this is an adaptive, uh, you know, optimizer or algorithm. So keep in mind when you say, you know, optimizers, they're algorithms. Okay. So this last part here is is basically some strategy behind uh, gradient descent. Like I said, there's analogies to this. And if you picture like if you have if you were, you know, just a barren plateau, it would take this, um, you know, if it's just like just a very gradual, you know, you want some steepness to it, but not so steep that the marble would skip. And 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 we see these types of oscillations uh, in grass. I'll show you. So obviously you want to measure these slopes and we're talking derivatives uh, efficiently with the fewest number of steps to get to the bottom, right? For time, right? So a lot of times, you know, you'll work down, you, you'll typically go down on optimizer, um, you know, learning rates to have more st steps, like more fine tuning for more performance, but that's not always the case. And, and these models that, you know, the algorithms, these optimizers are in there can be uh, quite complex. So, um, there's all, uh, besides just measuring slopes, you can do this with curvature to see, to determine how big the next steps are. So when you start to see these optimizers that mention history, so it's basically, you know, the previous loss that happened and it's uh, trying to project into the future uh, more accurately as opposed to some of these that are just straightforward and, and sometimes just inefficient. So I like this specific graphic because it's universal to both quantum and classical. So, where we are here is basically, you know, you run your, you know, classical algorithms, quantum algorithms, and we're looking at the whole model and the, the cost of, of it all. So, you know, cost is synonymous with loss. It's just, you know, basically like an extra step. So the input represents the data coming in. And these weights, let's just say the first weights are, you know, deep learning weights. And then, so these have their, you know, own fine tunes to it. And if you're doing, you know, like a advanced transformer millions or trillions of these can be optimized so they all have different values to it now let's say the next layer and this reminds me a lot of how how we can do this today with torch connector or torch layer uh taking a quantum circuit and literally putting it as a layer in inside of uh pytorch you know layers let's just say this next one the weights are coming from um a bunch of uh rotational gates so r y r x r z something like that and these two these angles and i i don't know the exact method of how it's done but let's just say they don't you know they're going to have different uh angles of each qubit so the values are going to be different uh similar to you know the way you know this these huge deep learning neural networks are done so we don't always necessarily have to go huge on quantum parameters, meaning the number of rotational gates, we just have to understand them better. So we're using uh, what we have in qubits and in uh, quantum inspired machine learning more effectively. Now this process, uh, these predictions, Y prime are the computers, what it thought of, you know, based on these initial weights. Okay. Now, if it's, if they're the same as the true targets, then you get a hundred percent. So you have zero loss. Okay. So you don't need to keep going through this optimizer. A lot of times the model might, you know, you set it to just shut itself off, but that's not usually the case. So the predictions, so what the computer thinks, say if it's an image and, you know, it thinks it's like, you know, an ant, but it's really a bee, or it thinks it's a, you know, this glioma tumor and it's actually this meningioma tumor. So it gets dinged um, basically with this loss function and you get this score. Okay. So based on this score, it goes back to the optimizer and the optimizer is always trying to figure this out. So keep in mind with this is that I, what it seems like where we are with quantum now is like how we have AlexNet to, you know, uh, maybe bigger ResNets. And then now we have like full GPT models with trillions of parameters is we're still in that stage of moving from a 2012 uh, PQC algorithm to another architecture, okay? 
So this process, both classical and quantum weights are optimized at the same time if you set it to that. So based on the model, you know, sometimes it's trickier, like the quantum transfer learning model, you know, you could, uh, you typically want to focus on the quantum algorithm and not the trainable weights on the uh, classical. But in general, the bigger these classical networks, the greater chances they have of adding more performance to the model. Uh, feel free. Are there any questions at this point? So I saw a number of people kind of come in here. And then, so if you haven't been to deeplearning.ai, uh, most of this, whatever was classical, same thing quantum, it's just, you know, the quantum algorithm had to be processed using penny lane or Kiskit or others, and then it's back into binary, okay? So like I said, a lot of times we're seeing the cost, um, but we're not seeing the performance of the quantum algorithm due to lack of understanding with, you know, increasingly larger data sets. And, you know, it's a complex problem to solve to advance the industry. So on this particular one, uh, they, they used a gradient descent model and uh, medium, I selected a uh, medium training set size. I set the batch size equal to the training set size, which means all of the images are run in a single, you know, go. <laughs> so as we see to the left with a small learning uh, rate, which means you have to take a lot of steps, it takes a while. So setting all things equal here with iterations, if it's however many seconds per iteration, it took 8,000 iterations and it never reached the minimum. So you can see that in this specific case, and the iteration with this graph goes to 8,000 and the orange line never touched this blue line. So this is an issue. However, um, this specific route is the because of the number of steps and the low learning rate, it actually, this curvature appears to be the um, most direct route. And this makes sense, right? This is a basic model. There's not too many other, you know, moving parts like a advanced uh, deep learning. But if you understand these things, it has benefit. So for the second one here, uh, it's set to a medium learning rate and it took 300 iterations and uh, to get here and actually probably less than that, but I just set it so they, you know, look about the same. So this is an uh, this is an acceptable learning rate for this because the curvature is is not as good as this other one, um, but it got to the target. It didn't time out, and it also only took three hundred iterations for this middle one. So for this right one, uh, we're looking at a large learning rate. So this is few number of steps. Remember, they're always inverse to each other, and it only took twenty iterations. However, if you compare it to the middle one or to the left, you see this kind of like kink, it looks like a hockey stick, right? So it, it's a lot less fine tuned and you're gonna get that, you know, with this is that, um, you know, your performance is not gonna be as good for that one. Now in real world data, I just ran this this week. This is the data re-uploading circuit. Um, this is a penny lane model. And basically this is the circuit up here. So it's three layers. So it's six gates of these specifics. And it's a different approach of using feature mapping uh, in the quantum realm. And it's just like, just like, let's just have a go at it. And I mean, the results seemed okay. As you could see with theirs, which is a 0.6 learning rate, uh, you can see the the accuracy was 84.7. Now, when I decreased the learning rate, meaning that um, I increased the number of steps, I was able to get this 90.6% represented by this best. And that's the only thing I changed, okay? So also in the study, I did variable batch size and variable layers. And in fact, it looks like they train these models. Uh, first, they get it to work, like the number of layers, and then everything's timed. So the number of batch that was selected for that notebook wasn't for performance, but it was for the lowest time uh, in two cases on batch size and then also for learning rates in these cases. So, you know, this is a more co complex, you know, problem. It doesn't have an additional classical neural network. It's just basically this quantum circuit to do binary classification of data. Um, lower losses tended to have lower accuracies, but not always. And runtimes were similar despite lowering the learning rates. So this is a thing that, you know, may require additional uh, look is basically, like I said, their 0.6 was the, the fastest. And then if you look at some of these other ones, they're very similar in time, but it's, it's changing the learning rate by 0.02, you know, every drop. 
So for that one. Okay, so how to select the, the correct QML loss function and optimizer. I think when most people think of quantum machine learning, they think of something that's unusually hard and not attainable at any time. And, and in fact, you know, we've got this worked out as an industry that we have, you know, say for instance, adjoint differentiation for efficient, you know, machine learning. It's basically back propagation with a circuit. We also have, you know, exact answers right away. And we're not limited to, you know, the quantum hardware. We're just calculating the, the what the uh, quantum circuits are. And, you know, so there's just, you know, there's no quantum noise. So everything is in, in ket notation or pure state. So no density matrix. So those three big things are what's helping Kimmel or quantum inspired machine learning. Now, um, so this is another, so this is Giordano of 2020. This is a, uh, not a meetup, um, a medium article. So basically they say, you know, we look at these like gradient descent methods, the evolution has gone from batch gradient uh, descent, so most basic, but however, it, it was slow. <laughs> you know, you think, you know, basic might be faster, but just, you know, basically we've learned from this and now that we can get, uh, you know, better compute and faster, better performance and faster. So stochastic gradient descent is still used to this day, and I'll get into it a little bit more. And it's using parameter updates for each example. Um, mini batch gradient descent, which they say of these three, I think came the latest of just gradient descent methods, uh, computes gradients on small batches. Now, adaptive gradient descent, you hear of a ton, and say, for instance, Adagrad, you'll see, so when you select whatever optimizer, adapts the learning rate to parameters, add a delta, now has a history window. So I mentioned that before, kind of like, you know, when it's going down these wells, you know, it, it's using what was uh, happened previously to kind of like forecast into the future. And then Atom is the most common, most popular. Uh, they'll you typically don't have to adjust anything but the learning rate. Um, and it adds the storing method. RMS prop for a different way of uh, uh, these past gradients, right? So we're, we're talking adaptive, right? Like, so uh, better understanding of how these uh, optimizer algorithms work. And usually you start, you know, especially for a lot of quantum models, you'll, you'll see Adam. I still see a fair amount, um, you know, with stochastic gradient descent. And one of the strategies that they said for this is, you know, in order to select your correct, you know, conditions is first start out off with Atom optimize, Optimizer to get results without fine tuning. But this means adjusting the learning rate, you know, uh, try going up a little bit. If it keeps getting worse, then try going down. So if that's, you always want to try stochastic gradient descent after that, uh, if a good learning rate annealing schedule is known. So for, for these, you know, and likely others too, slowly decrease the learning rate if high oscillations are experienced. So that would typically mean if you're raising the learning rate or decreasing the number of steps, you start to see oscillations just like if you're going down a well with a marble, you know, too fast, you know, you're, it'll skip those types of things. Are there any questions or comments at this point? So I saw, yeah, so it's definitely worth you know, spending some time with this because I, when I watch a lot of these Penny Lane videos on YouTube, they say it's more about the deep learning specifics, which these are as compared to like the, you know, the super in-depthness of, of quantum algorithms and, you know, those types of things. Like, yes, it's going to add more cost, you know, qubit per bit, just because it has complex numbers and it's just this, you know, thing you can do more with. So hopefully this gap will start to come down, um, you know, with with uh, quantum just, you know, just adding costs. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Ron put in the chat, so check out that book. Um, so I'm gonna go into these and basically, uh, so Qiskit has a good package, right? So they have their own loss function or they've converted it into Qiskit. So it's easy to access, you know, without having to, um, you shouldn't have to go into buy, PyTorch, even though with Qiskit you can, they have a connector uh, to PyTorch. So you'll see the local optimizers with adaptive uh, and basic, I kind of highlighted there. And I believe these are all the ones that were listed that are local, you know, for uh, local loss functions and local optimizers. So there's convenience, you know, not having to go and switch into different libraries. And I'll, I'll get into some of these other frameworks that, that do that. 
so with PyTorch, I put this is basically because with PennyLine, you can tap into PyTorch just like Qiskit can. And, you know, so once you say like everything is, you know, it's a Python, it's a Python notebook, but the machine, machine learning aspects look like a classical machine learning model. And then now, you know, so these are some of the loss functions. So L1 loss, MSU loss, cross entropy loss. These are very common to use. So, you know, even though you pip installed, you know, Penny Lane or, and, you know, PyTorch or Torch. And now for the machine learning part, say if you're using Penny Lane, now you could start to, to use the PyTorch um, optimizers and, and loss functions here too. So that's, there's 21 total. So I would say out of everybody, um, Penny Lane's NumPy, I think is specifically, they built the optimizers based on NumPy, but I, I don't think they're available to everybody else. But PyTorch has a really good uh, set of loss functions and optimizers, you know, to select from and, and to experiment with. And find some good guides on Medium, um, YouTube videos, those types of things before you really get rolling with it. Because you don't want to really, you know, spend at a Delta check 20 different learning rates next <laughs> at a grad, especially if it's like a, a complex uh, system that you're dealing with here. So Keras is basically, it's TensorFlow. So you see tf.keras.losses or .optimizers. And what Keras has is um, very similar to PyTorch, just a little bit less. But, you know, in general, the, the notion is a lot of times, you know, you can get similar performance, you know, if you're Torch-based versus you know, TensorFlow based or Keras based in, in, you know, many cases, right? They're not, they're not too different to, from each other if you're proficient in using it. So you'll see, you know, 19 total loss classes and then also 12 total optimizers as well. And these are just uh, some of them shown uh, the, you know, on the right here, the adaptive algorithms. So moving into TensorFlow Quantum. So TensorFlow Quantum, um, when I first started my journey, you know, back this is like encoding, you know, April or, you know, March, I was able to get some of these to run, you know, they're just one click into CoLab. And now I'm, you know, trying all these things and it might be a Python 3.9 issue, these types of things. But there's, the um, as far as GitHub, there's a fair number of people that actually, you know, they participate to the TensorFlow Quantum uh you know, discussions. So I, I think it is alive and active. It, you just get to have to get up over the first hurdle of, <laughs> you know, re-getting things to learn if, it, you know, previously it worked before. But, um, you know, so basically ten TensorFlow Quantum has little in, in the form of optimizers. Uh, basically these two, there's a gentleman, uh, Owen Lockwood. He does dozens of these TensorFlow Quantum videos. And he had sent me this link and I also found it too. Um, I appreciate that. But, um, you know, as far as there's, there's, you're basically building off of Keras with this, you know? So 19 total classes with Keras and then 12 total optimizers with Keras as well. And then, so Penny Lane's, Penny Lane's the, the one that's really interesting. Okay. So you could do JAX, PyTorch or TensorFlow for loss functions or optimizers with Penny Lane. So uh, when you have your devs, you know, or Q, uh, QML .Q nodes, these types of things, there's an option to put in an interface. Uh, so it's just, you further extend that parenthesis and you go comma interface TF for TensorFlow or Torch or, or JAX. So that'll get you into their system. And I've used a fair number, their convolutional neural network demo has used TensorFlow. Their quantum transfer learning uh, demo uses uh, PyTorch. And then I probably run some jacks. I can't because it's part of their QML thing, and I've run all those too. So as a default, it's not those three. It's NumPy. So you don't have to spe specify an interface. And I just reached out this morning, and I think it was Ivan at uh, Xanadu basically said that you have to uh, define a custom loss function which is what I was finding in these notebooks. Okay, they're uh, QML demos. Now, NumPy also lists some of their own loss and uh, I, th I think at least loss function, probably optimizers too, but I'm not quite sure if you can use those, right? So they say NumPy and I think Penny Lane wrote them in NumPy because I don't think you can do QNG optimizer you know, up to QNSPSA optimizer. These are quantum specifics for optimizer. 
But for loss functions, when you open a lot of these demos, they're written custom uh, loss functions. So you have the loss of it converted into a cost. And it, apparently that's just a very common thing to do. As opposed to going in and say, like in PyTorch, you would have, you know, binary cross, cross entropy or, you know, tensor flow, the same kind of thing for loss function. So that's the part that wasn't like, I, I don't know if that's for, I think it's for uniqueness or for customizability as a, with the loss function, as opposed to, you know, uh, having defined loss functions and some of these other ones. And then, so here's all of the NumPy other ones. So again, you don't need to specify the interface to add a grad. So these are all adaptive, these first three. And then you have like a basic gradient descent and then going all the way down. Now they said, uh, I think it's Thomas is a huge fan of this adaptive optimizer. And it actually lets you select the number of layers. And there's a demo, it's quantum chemistry that if depending on the molecule, it selects uh, the number of layers in your quantum circuit to, to you, or to, I think it's just choosing it so that you can use it. I'm trying to do this, but inside a workflow where I can, you know, say decrease layers over time, um, you know, bring some of this advanced deep learningness in, into the mix. <laughs> and then here you go with Torch Quantum. So Torch Quantum, um, it's not too, it's one of the newer ones and they did a really good job. They had a couple, couple conferences and it was this huge thing, tons of notebooks. I haven't heard too much more from Torch Quantum. I've been trying to run their demos. Um, so it's MIT and it's worth taking a, a closer look into, especially if you're into the super fine tuning, you know, <laughs> probably surpassing many of the, the penny lane notebooks, but that's just the way it seems. It's just like even running uh, the, the installs takes a long time because there's so much incorporated with these, you know, optimize, trying to optimize circuits, but we're talking about optimizing, you know, the model. Now, coming back to this, you know, with the main summary is it's quite easy to get started with this. Don't skip steps. Uh, I did this four series and I put the link in, I'll have it up. Um, of this researcher in Boston, you know, with deep learning, all this type of stuff. And he broke it down into marbles going into wells and these, you know, cold and hot tea examples. And the first video was really great for me. And the other three were just more kind of specific and, you know, things to get into. But the first one was really good. So, so they say gradient descent provides, you know, this efficiency, um, you know, for these added complexities of quantum deep learning and, and deep learning too. So the way I would look at this is basically, you know, if you search for this is like, do you have to decrease the learning rate if you're using a quantum circuit in a hybrid notebook now? And I think it's just overall complexity because, you know, a qubit with it rotating and uh, complex numbers, those types of things are going to have these additional layers of complexity that a bit just doesn't have. So the goal is to measure slopes efficiently with few steps. And the takeaways is, is basically this. So with the loss functions, you know, your PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, those are, you know, part of the library and you just select them. For Penny Lame, it, it seems like it's more of a custom thing. And for optimizers, you know, uh, you know, gradient descent, you know, there's three of three big ones that came out with that, and then these series of adaptives. But you want the ones to start with, you know, atom optimizer, and then try stochastic gradient descent for many cases. And then also, um, the only thing you should really have to change with atom at, at first, because there's like beta one, beta two, and epsilon, is the learning rate. And, you know, like if it, I have a technique myself, so some of these learning rates, like for quantum transfer learning, they're like 0.0004, they're really low, which means they take longer because you know there's more complexity to it so off that i would go up a little bit you know uh 0. 0.00042 and then like a, a 4446 and then at that that point if it's just getting worse then i'll just start going down like a 0. 0.00038 and then 36 34 you know so that that seems to be working well now there's room for improvements with this um so like i said like you know, some of these demos that are, you know, if you have like a, a ResNet 18 plus, you know, quantum circuit with Hadamard gate, basically an embedding layer and uh, more trainable rotational gates and, and CNI gates, 
you know, that's going to add some complexity to it all. So Qiskit, TensorFlow Quantum and Torch Quantum, they tend, they trend to use these familiar loss functions. Now, Penny Lane is kind of like unique in that, um, like I said, the, the NumPy loss functions, you know, in the notebooks I see, they're just, they're handwritten. Um, but as far as it goes deeper, you know, because it's got six quantum specific NumPy optimizers, as well as a bunch of familiar ones, and actually some that say Q <laughs> in it too, you know, Q for quantum. Actually, I have to vary. Sometimes Q can be quantitative. So, but anyways, the, the huge benefit with uh, Penny Lane is you can access the loss and optimizers of uh, TensorFlow, T Torch, and JAX. So they probably spent a lot of time to make that happen. And are there any questions at this point? So any specific slides? I see we have, so another comment in the chat here. So yeah, feel free to reach out if you do have questions, if it's something specific. Um, also on GitHub too, I pretty much put all the notebooks up. So this is all the Penny Lane modified demos, all the Kiskit modified uh, machine learning demos, those types of things. Okay, so Alejandro says, just for suggestions, two amazing projects. Okay, so in this orchestra, as we're checking out, um, is there anything as far as the slides that people wanna see more of? at this point. And, you know, it's just, it's a very deep field, right? So those that just wanted quantum, <laughs> you're get, you get a lot of classical, you know? So it's just, that's how it is. It's, it's just chugging through the, the quantum algorithm and it, it's a special Python function that returns everything back into binary. So it's more like deep learning, <laughs> deep learning with a little bit of quantum. I would say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're talking about algorithms here. So, you know, optimizers or, or algorithms in specific. So those evolve over time. And I, you've heard me say this before in previous discussions, but basically I don't see us keeping the standard format that we have with a, a PQC model that's meant for noisy quantum computers. Um, that's you could do on both simulator and quantum computers when simulators can do far more, you know, reverse or, you know, you basically are very limited with the type of differentiation with uh, quantum computers and outputting, you know, things exact values right away or, or, or an issue. But who knows, you know, in a couple of years, you know, these could come. Yeah, and I'll put it in the chat here. Um, anybody that we haven't heard from in the in the chat so far? So I would say the people <laughs> that are closest towards you know QML you know uh, performance are those in deep learning, and if somebody gave them the algorithm, you know the quantum algorithm that's different. Um, but, you know, they, they could probably take this presentation and go much, much deeper with it in, in classical deep learning that, that helped the hybrid uh, network. And I put it in the chat there. So there's the GitHub. I appreciate everybody, um, you know, going on, liking, starring, you know, forking, th these types of things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a collaborative effort you know, as far as getting, you know, the, these to the next stages. Now, one of the slides uh, I put up in this particular demonstration was, it's called data re-uploading. So it's basically skipping out on this notion of having to have an embedding layer and getting, going straight to a two qubit, uh, I'm sorry, single qubit, two gate uh, layer model. And then say the authors fine-tuned it to three layers, which I couldn't make better one through 10, you know? And anyways, there's exponential runtime RAM requirements when you have more and more qubits. So if we could take advantage of the rich nature of a, of a quantum bit, or it can also do, you can do q q ports and simulators. You can go up, as far as I know, Say, say, for instance, if it's 10 dimensions, that would be a 10 class classification uh, with that. And I've done that in, I think it was CERC, 
just set up the set up the um the gates and i haven't been able to run something like that so anyways if you can figure out a way to do things with just a single or two qubits and you know we're we're less in the realm of entangling right because that's you know uh computationally expensive however that's where you get exponential information and potentially faster we're more in the realm of of trying to map data sets over a, uh, the surface of the qubit in pure states in order to get better you know classifications those types of things so this doesn't show up too much i would say in headlines as far as you know feature embedding data reuploading these types of things but i i think that it's the practical side of QML without having a, you know, fully entangled, you know, well-working circuit, um, big data set, that, that type of stuff that, you know, we're understanding, you know, this class goes here and this class goes here. And it has been done by Seth Lloyd and Maria Schold and uh, Chris and Temi, you know, these types of things. It's just based on our model, you'll get to a point and you'll have limited accuracy and people say, oh, we can't go any further. We're in fact like we need to go from like that that AlexNet you know deep learning network you know on the quantum side to like this ResNet fifty <laughs> or over hundred but most people many people use fifty <laughs> yeah so I put the GitHub in the chat and you almost have to take a class and go to some uh, meetups to figure out how to use GitHub <laughs> but once you do it's um I think it's quite rewarding. You know, put put your actual notebooks up. Chances are whatever you have, you know, <laughs> it's not going to hold any, you know, like we, we need to advance other things in quantum. I, I don't think anybody's going to be able to find some awesome things besides all these literature papers that we read. And, you know, they basically say little advantage or the same, you know, performance is classical. Any thoughts with that as far as just the fundamental like qubit, right? So yes, it, like if you have a single qubit, you can run a ton more data, you know, faster and you don't have these complexities, you know, time and, and RAM, those types of things. But as far as this fundamental qubit with complex numbers and processing data, you know, not even getting into machine learning, does anybody have uh, any input with that? And then, so I saw Javier hop on, uh, Mohammed. you could also chime in as well. Feel free, you can unmute, you could also um, start your video as well. But I mean, it's worth, it's worth taking some time to think about things, right? If, if there's been thousands of papers out there and nobody's, you know, breaking through with a specific algorithm that's significantly better. Um, I've heard of the the Google researchers training with less data. Penny Lane researchers actually say that does, you know, today, you know, stand, stand true. You know, there's a quantum benefit in that. Yeah, go ahead, Alejandro. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I was working uh, with uh, chemical data sets with smiles molecules, yeah, and the scriptors and so on. And I'm interested in the complex space that we can address with quantum computing. So how how can we work with that? How can how can you imagine that we work with that? I suppose that of course, uh, super vector machines and deep learning net networks and so on, but can you have a thought on that, Kevin? Um, potentially, you know, say for instance, so Penny Lane uh, chemistry, and then so you have um, Kiskit nature at this point, I think it's considered quantum data, right? So we're, you're not experiencing this uh, embedding kind of like losing time and performance kind of thing with, you know, if we use classical data, like financial data or medical data, those types of things. So, you know, it's a holy grail. It's um, typically, I think Penny Lane, they only have uh, the first two or three rows of the periodic table. So, you know, that's just all things can handle. And 
you know, it's a it's interesting because you know you're seeing more of like the like the the pure you know pure quantum data as opposed to like you know when we try to get images in that aren't those types of things so it has that benefit and you know there's there's i think two main limitations the main is our understanding of the qubit with data sets now the other one is um you know ram i think penny lane caps their simulators at 40 and say for instance like terra quantum you can go up to 40 qubits but it just depends on how big your you know how many layers you have these types of things and uh aws i think it's 34 qubits for their sv1 and probably higher for their tensor network one maybe 40 or higher so you know it, it oh, i think pennyland cap caps it at 30 because people want to do cool stuff <laughs> not just like you know lithium hydride or you know some of these other ones but you know, just really small molecules is basically what, what you're set with. I, I don't know too much more than that as far as like what people have been able to do that's really cool with it because I think running reactions and, you know, advanced synthesis and these types of things are kind of out of the question if you're dealing with just very, they're, you know, they're just pairs. They're just like, um, you know, like, just or sometimes i think you can do h2o right but that's just where the state of where that as and i think it's more in that point because i think with the, that stuff all of these values in chemistry world have been previously experimentally determined right so it's more of like the ram limitation i can get you up to speed with uh on colab using a single gpu um you're basically just you it's an extra line of code and i i don't know how compatible that is with the quantum sem chemistry data set you know either kiskit or, or penny lane with that so but yeah it seems like that's the huge order hurdle with this is when you're talking molecular orbitals um you know and you, you're typically gain, gaining an orbital down the the periodic table is this adds more and more uh cost to the CPU or GPUs too. <laughs> so I, I think that's where that's at. Like, cause it's trying to do it perfectly. Right. And, you know, as we see with like, uh, you know, app atom optimizer gradient descent, as opposed to like exact, you know, values, these are approximations too. So you can see you could see the room for development as far as like, okay, well, we can get this within 99.99%. And then now we could do the third and fourth row of the periodic table, that type of stuff. So I wouldn't, you know, get hung up with it, but you know, I think it's like it's just it's just um it, you know, it's infancy because it, you know, there's a lot even in an atom, right? Between all the calculations, those types of things. So, you know, when people want to, and perhaps somebody could else chime, chime in, if you could do this with a simulated uh, quantum annealer, I think Fujitsu goes up to like 60, 60 or, or 70 qubits and they're, they're pure, you know, pure states, not like, you know, like a 5,000 qubit you know, that's physical. So... But yeah, once you have these like exact calculations, I don't think there's any room for anything that's like, you know, any types of quantum noise, you know, for uh, quantum chemistry, but other applications. Yes. So any other question? That's a good question. Thanks for asking that, because it, it, it's a big component of their quantum data data sets. I know at least for Penny Lane, I imagine for Kiskit too. And I, yeah, yeah. So feel free to raise your hand if, if you have any other questions. So yeah, for drug discovery too, and you know, these are high approximations and either it's possible to use, you know, physical annealers. And I know people are doing these types of things where the end answer is better than anything classically, even if you had all that, the quantum noise for those specific cases. So, you know, optimizing the number of boxes in a, in a warehouse those types of things but you know it's going to be a while 
<laughs> you know, it, it, we're, we're talking like approximates, but, you know, for exact every, you know, atom on a, a DNA strand is way out of reach, you know, and I think even many classical computers too, you know, they do approximations. So what are, what, what are, you know, good quantum approximations to take? Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, so the uh, the whole uh, Kiskit nature thing, I just finished a uh, certificate course a couple weeks ago from Open HPI, and I, be and I believe that's their website, openhpi.com, or might be something else. Um, and the whole session was about uh, using the Kiskit nature framework to solve energy states for some fairly simple molecules like one the the standard one in quantum is lithium lithium something i can never remember the second one um but basically you have to have under you have to have an understanding of the, the quantum mathematics uh you know schrodinger's equations you're solving a Hamiltonian for an energy level, and you're basically mapping that that solution directly onto a quantum circuit. So it's pretty cool. I don't. I still need to study a lot more to understand the whole business of um, of uh, propagating the Hamiltonian. And uh, in a simple sense, it just comes down to finding its eigen values and its eigenvectors and going through as many iterations as you feel you need to until you find the lowest energy state. Um, but this has been demonstrated in, as quantum algorithms on machines we have today. And it is true. They, you know, you can only, it can only, right now it can only handle relatively small molecules, but as the size of quantum machines get bigger, it's going to ramp up pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, I, that that sounds right. As far as like what I've come across, um, anything else in in the quantum data sets besides quantum chemistry? Uh, that's all, that's all we studied in that course. Uh, but it's obvious that there's a ton of stuff in Kiskit nature. Yeah. Um, so it, it's that. I mean, you could probably make a career out of just studying that stuff. Uh, and then on the other note about uh, the there are quantum algorithms that are out there that are being put in use and people are making money on them. And they have to do with what you had mentioned, Kevin, the um, uh, basically like the graph based problems, the traveling salesman, the, the knapsack problem. Um, and these, these are being done on D wave and penny lane and people are selling this as a service now to like a trucking company. For example, uh, with the help of a quantum computer, they get a slightly better routing, which saves them some gas money. Right. Uh, th this is this is happening. This is definitely happening, and even with the uh, machines that we have today, and again, as as the size of the machines get bigger, these things are going to get more efficient. It's uh, we are we are at the we are at the point now where uh, the the physical hardware is setting matching pace with the biggest simulators we have, but they are, it's just going to be a matter of not that much time before they outstrip the simulators. Uh, we get bigger machines online and, and they are definitely coming. Yeah. Yeah. That's all interesting. I mean, I don't see too, too much of that, but I knew it has been existing for some time, like port of Los Angeles and certain you know small pieces of met i know Pol polaris qb you know uses uh quantum annealing you know physical and I, I think other ones too you know say for instance um if you, if you go to the d-wave site and look into their marketing stuff that you, you'll see some of the places that are using it there's a, a grocery chain in canada that uh that d-wave is working with deliver working with directly and that, so this is not a huge company. It's you know it's a chain. It's a grocery chain. So it's not tiny, but it's not it's not General Electric either. Um, and they're using the quantum advantage to route their delivery trucks better. 
and they are getting a result. So, yeah. Uh, and that's using D-Wave's hardware. Now, D-Wave, uh, depending on where you look over there, they, they're like, well, we have our annealer has 5,000 qubits. Well, it's kind of how many you need to do a good job at some of this stuff. But uh, D-Wave's quantum computer is only good at certain things. It's not even a complete quantum computer. It doesn't meet all of the all of the criteria for qubits. But what it can do, it does well, and this can be mapped to optimization problems. So that's that's what D-Wave's focus is. Yeah, I mean, that all makes sense. Um, there was something in the chat from uh, Mohammed here. It says, for exact ML results, you need big data. Is there an analog for QML? So that so the study I did this week, I put it on LinkedIn on the website. It's basically using a single qubit. So you can go a lot higher on data set size. Although at like, you know, if it was 2,200, 22,000, 220,000, it's, it's slow down there you know, at 220K. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, but entanglement with simulators, I I don't know if you get the time benefit to it because it adds cost, because <laughs> it's not native. You know what I mean? Like it's not, entanglement in a quantum computer is native, right? But we're far way out because of the noise. So I, I'm not quite, it's not quite sure to me Um because they say exponentially more data because, you know, two to the N or N is the number of qubits fully entangled is the, is the equation for that. But I, I haven't experienced it myself where, well, I've switched from like a CZ to a C naught and it helped in certain demos. Um, but I, I think it's missing the, cause it's not native with the entangling. I, I think it's missing that component of, potential speed ups versus real hardware. So you're more or less relying on rotational gates and optimizing those like with, you know, uh, quantum machine learning uh, for feature mapping, these types of things. So moving forward, I think with a lot of this stuff um, is you're going to see a mixture, you know, like Ron said, I, I see the quantum inspired stuff like NVIDIA and Brookhaven are scaling up experiments right now with these GPU quantum exper experiments with machine learning. Um, I just put that in there. So I think that's maybe coming first because it has no noise. <laughs> now in mission critical things like a single piece of financial data that could get affected by quantum noise, you know, or a medical data, you know, you're inferencing, you know, it, I, I don't see quantum computers kind of touching that, but it'll be interesting to see where everything will kind of fall in line, I believe, you know, as far as like, you know, use Kimmel or quantum inspired here, and then use quantum computer, I would say in two years here, and then the quantum annealing stuff, you know, like I said, where, where the data is not like a single data file doesn't, it's more like the, the whole accuracy of it all, you know, I would say uh, that's coming after Kimmel for me because uh, there was a Wall Street article, with, Wall Street Journal article with Kimmel and Sandbox AQ, which got five hundred million dollars. They're using GPU quantum simulators to take advantage of quantum mechanics. And I like again, like you know, the whole industry needs better understanding of like big data sets and um, qubits those types of things. So there's more to the question. So is there an analog for QML with the big data? It just depends. Like typically where we are with simulators, 30 qubits or however much RAM without running it on a supercomputer like Google Supremacy, th that simulator versus that quantum computer. Um, you're always going to be less on data. I think data sets in these cases. So, you know, as far as you know, exact ML approaches, I, you might have to further clarify that because I think you can get that, you know, with, uh, you know, simulators, it's just a CPU uh, simulating uh, quantum mechanics or qubits. And then doesn't entanglement enter as a correlation between data? That's where, you know, additional research is needed for me um, because like I said, I, I don't see a ton of this on simulators because it, entanglement, you know, like I said, it's it's typically a, a very costly uh, gate. You know, it's a lot more costly Hadamar and definitely or definitely Hadamar and more than a rotational gate. So that'll be interesting. But I, I know that people are using it in uh, quantum inspired. 
And then how would that process affect the whole process? So, yeah, that's a good question. Cause I, you know, in a theoretically fully entangled circuit, you know, you could do much more data um, on a quantum computer because you don't need all that RAM. Now we need that RAM, you know, on a, on a, on, for quantum inspired. So I, that's the issue there. As far as taking advantage of other quantum mechanical effects, including interference that simulators can do because it's just simulating quantum physics perfectly without noise. Um, it's interesting. I, I want to say you can't you you can take advantage of you know not just superpositioning you know like Hadamard entangling and now quantum interfer in interference that you know I I think that you still get those benefits but the drawback is it's not native and you have to use a lot more RAM. I I, I think that's what it is, right? Because they say, you know, it's basically a perfect qubit, right? It's the physics, you know, a quantum mechanics just perfectly represented in a, in a classical computer. There's no quantum noise. Uh, any other questions? I appreciate all the, the comments here. But yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the questions here from, I think it was Mohammed as far as quantum data, or you were talking about quantum chemistry, is there's one of these demos, I think it was CERC I, and or TensorFlow Quantum, and they, they use stilted quantum data from a regular fashion MNIST data set. So I don't know if that counts, <laughs> right? So these types of things to try to, you know, you're basically converting classical data into quantum, even though it wasn't captured with a, like a quantum sensor. But anyways, this adds, you know, this to me, you know, if you could process pure quantum data without embedding anything in, in a way to kind of like pseudo prepare it, like, so it's stilted like that, then you're probably talking in that that realm of, you're gonna start seeing these real uh, quantum benefits, especially, you know, data set mapping, I would say. And, you know, you kind of keep an eye on everything, right? So somebody, if somebody's working in the lab, you know, with a quantum sensor and they have like, you know, uh, a day worth of quantum RAM, <laughs> you know, these types of things, collecting data, they ran all this stuff and you can use it. And, um, right. So you don't want to get too, too focused in a specific area because you have to see what else is going on out there. But I, you know, with this Kimmel stuff for Quantum Inspire, there's a Tom's hardware article and it's based on additional research with, you know, GPU quantum simulators being way faster, you know, bandwidth wise than any upcoming quantum computer. And then it also said that they'll outpace a, a single GPU quantum simulator will outpace um, uh, any quantum computer for some time. So, you know, the whole thing, right? Like, I know we have 400 qubit Osprey and <laughs> these things, but the noise is still there. So sometimes I think uh, one of them actually is, uh, I know the 127, the Eagle, you can access pretty well. Uh, I don't know if you have like free access to the 433. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, you you can get time on the Eagle, but you're, uh, you know, IBM's, uh, uh, implementation of quantum computers has its issues. Uh, the main one being is the uh, qubit to qubit interconnectivity. Um, so on on the Eagle, you can go, you can probably go find the uh, and download the connectivity map. Um, and they try to put it into they call it a double hex or a folded hex grid. And the idea is. Um, you're supposed to it's supposed to keep all the qubits within a few jumps of, of the other ones but in their worst you know their worst cases are like 14 jumps uh, like if you pick you know the middle qubit the, the center of the grid is your uh, is your middle cube or your center qubit is in some cases uh, 12 13 14 jumps away from the perimeter qubits yeah so they spend so much time in their transpilers uh moving qubits around uh, so they because the, the 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 
death nail for IBM are the are the controlled NOT gates, and that's the only way they can do swaps. They do as as it, it takes three controlled knots to do a, a a qubit swap, and so now if you've got a if you've got a move a qubit even four or five places away, that's like now you got fifteen swap you fifteen C knots to do five swaps yeah. or three swaps or or five swaps. Yeah, I because so, of all the so their, their scale is just going to be problematic for a while. Yeah. But yeah. the other technologies like the annealers and stuff. Um, they're, they, they, they're continuing to move forward. The neutral atoms, QERA is now saying that their 256-bit um, uh, qubit neutral atom machine is uh, in product or is in beta stage. Um, that's about all I know about it. It doesn't sound like it's been brought online yet, but um, it, they, I, it feels like they're getting close. So that's going to be a machine with lots of lots of coherence time, uh, none of the issues of connectivity because in a neutral atom system you can associate any two qubits in the array with each, with each other just by moving them in a split you know a nanosecond um, or or maybe a little bit slower than that but uh, they're they're moving the atoms doesn't cause noise like a control not gate does and you don't you don't have to put in these these fake or these uh these uh filler uh steps you can just make two qubits interact with each other and any any two in the 256 bit, uh qubit array um so there's there's stuff's going to happen and then that's going to be a machine that's 256 qubits wide so it's definitely going to outstrip the simulators um they're st still going to have deaf problems you know, even though the noise is way, is better and the coherence is better, it, there's still coherence. Simulators don't have coherence problems; they will run forever. Um, but uh, it's going to be very exciting in the next uh, twelve months for sure. Yeah, I put in the chat there. So every Friday they have a, a speaker. Now, last week it was uh, machine learning to help quantum noise, and. My understanding of it, I, I thought you could just use a classical model, but it, it looked like they were using a quantum random forest model, which is a type of machine learning with a, a, a quantum circuit, maybe four qubits. And because if you can switch over to just classical machine learning somehow to detect error and then correct it. And as far as number of parameters, you're probably going to have deep learning and likely much, you know, like trillions, like how much quantum noise is there, <laughs> you know? So anyways, if you can learn it off, maybe a smaller quantum computer, then scale it up. But that was the thing I, I wasn't quite sure about is like, if they had to use a, a quantum, you know, machine learning to, uh, you know, detect and, you know, would do whatever with the noise. And you're going to be limited these days with parameters and in, in, in quantum compared to, in my view, a ton of noise coming off of a quantum computer. So that's just one of those yeah. cases where, you know. Yeah, well, Q, QML is definitely going to be hybrid for a very long time because quantum computers are just things that it, that it doesn't do well, like arithmetic. Um <laughs> It's 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 very tedious just to get uh, quantum the computer to add add two numbers together. Um, so why use why use them for that when classicals do that like in a in a picosecond? Um, so that's the that's the one area where quant it, it, the bigger quantum gets, the better the QML will get. But uh, it will I don't know how close we are to having a pure quantum machine learning instance. Um, there's just, I mean, everywhere you look in, in machine learning, there's math, there's, you know, gradient descents. It's just, it's all basic math and quantum computers are not really good at basic math. They're, 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 they native, natively do their computing with probabilities. So, yeah. And uh, I think like a faster training problem, that's not specific to like, you know, well, just mostly for training, 
I, I see that for real hardware coming up, but maybe in isolated cases, but I see the workflows being uh, quantum inspired. And this is the main, everybody wants to do uh, machine learning, right? So in, in many different industries. So I would keep an eye on the Brookhaven. So it's Brookhaven, Penny Lane Software, NVIDIA GPUs, and then one other organization with that, NERSC, something like that, some other national kind of lab kind of thing. Um, but yeah, definitely check out the Kiskit stuff. Uh, I'm typically there. So for me, it's Friday mornings at nine. I think it's uh, 12 uh, Eastern and then what, 11 Central. So definitely check those out. Um, any other last questions or comments? Yeah, the, the Kiskit series is really good. Um, I did see that last one and uh, they were actually, it appears to seem to me they were using quantum computers for two things. One, one to run part of the algorithm and the other one to gener to generate specific um, training data. So yeah. it was like two different phases. Yeah. And all of this research is not going to waste, I don't think, because like even if superconducting qubits uh, go, you know, fall behind, you know, ion trap or neutral atom, you know, they're still like, oh, well, we could do this easier here or our, or, you know, connectivity is unlimited, you know, these types of things too. So, um, you know, definitely, you know, I, IBM, um, I'm trying to think when Kiskit was launched. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Google quantum supremacy was 2019. And then, you know, this accelerated some things and then eventually, uh, I'd have to check my dates, but I want to say Penny Lane and Kiskit were before quantum supremacy. So um, it's all very interesting. Awesome. Any other uh, last questions or comments? So this is uh, basically, I think this presentation in specific showed what we kept talking about, the hybridness between classical and quantum. And you see like the importance of opti optimizing deep learning, you know, with now with quantum circuits, using the same loss functions and optimizers as we did before. So, I, and again, I think the deep learning people don't, don't realize the parallels. <laughs> you know, the, you know, uh, it won't be too hard for them, I don't think, with s somebody giving them a quantum circuit and then them uh, optimizing the whole model, so. Awesome. Well, this has been discussion 104, uh, October 12th, for how to cr select the correct QML loss function and optimizer. I uh, appreciate everybody for coming on. My name is Kevin Kocek. I'm the founder and CEO of Chemical Q Device. Uh, have a good night and have a productive rest of the week. Take care, everybody. Bye.